On this episode of Athletic Training Chat, we have Sean Goff, where we talk about shoulder impingement and athletic training in esports. This is our first venture into esports on this podcast, which I found it fascinating to just get into some of the nuanced details, not only about what esports are, but the potential care for them and what that looks like from the athletic trainer. Also, when we get talking about shoulder impingement, which is what we start off with, these are the episodes I truly really enjoy when it comes to different pathologies because Sean breaks down all of the research and the mechanics and the biomechanics, the physiology of shoulder impingement and really makes you consider have you been using that term maybe inappropriately in your diagnoses as you're working with people and maybe using it as a catch-all when you're really looking at it. So really he gets in depth with that and it's I think very valuable to listen to. So I hope you get a lot out of it just like I did uh, as I've been working back in clinic after doing this interview. As always, we are powered by Mueller Sports Medicine. If you're going to NATA, be sure to check them out. They are going to have a full setup, all new, the new things they're looking to show everybody, getting your feedback uh, and taking in um, all they can from the athletic trainers there. So without further ado, Please enjoy this episode. Welcome to this episode of Athletic Training Chat. Uh, we are on with Sean Goff today, and we are going to talk about potentially related things, but not, maybe not so much. We'll see where it goes, but uh, talking about shoulder impingement and why that's kind of gotten almost too catch-all, if you will, but we'll get into the details of that. And then also about esports. Uh, he brings a unique insight to that, which we'll let him dive into, but uh semi-professional player which i'm curious as to what that completely means in starcraft 2 um and i plead my ignorance i haven't kept up on those things for quite a while so i don't have a ton of background there but before we get into that starting off with the shoulder impingement just wanted to turn it over to you to fill in your background um you're in a new, unique position now working industrial and high school uh, but i've also seemingly done some pretty other cool things in your career thus far so yeah, so uh been an athletic trainer for over 11 years now and started off in the junior college setting. In fact, I I started off at the same college uh, that I went to because I went to a community college at first because I had no idea what, what I wanted to do. That's fair. Uh, and shoulder impingement actually got me into the career of athletic training because uh, I, I hurt my shoulder playing baseball. I played baseball until I was 28, uh, but I, I hurt it when I was in a, a community college and uh, I went to see a physical therapist and also work with the athletic trainer and, uh, you know, just kind of talking about, hey, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. And they're like, well, why don't you look into athletic training? And I, I had no idea what athletic training was. I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. So, I mean, <laughs> that's pretty much how that how that started. Uh, but, yeah, so that's probably when it's like 19 or 20. Uh, but, yeah, so... Um, you know, worked at uh, the community college for like five, six years or so, and then got into the industrial setting. Uh, you know, worked at uh, the airport in Minneapolis with Delta employees, went back and got my master's, uh, worked at like a beta production manufacturing, then went out to uh, uh, Wisconsin here. And uh, now I recently started my doctorate. Um, but yeah, so uh, shoulder impingement is uh, kind of unique in that it, it literally brought me to the profession of athletic training. Because it was either going to be that or it's going to be a meteorologist. So. <laughs> that That's quite the split. I like it, though. <laughs> I do argue that that meteorologist job where you can be wrong half of the time and still keep your job is a pretty sweet gig. Oh, I know. Uh, right? When it comes to that. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll save kind of the eSport thing as we get into there. So shoulder impingement, really interesting. You know, someone that yourself that has – gone through it and dealt with it and that's a, i like the backstory of how you got that in and then i'm only assuming that you've treated and worked with plenty of it 
um one of the topics when we were just messaging back and forth as we were trying to figure it out is you wanted to discuss why it is not a pathoanatomical diagnosis yeah and how that all comes to play because just even in my experience you know I think it's just because it's easier for sometimes patients to understand. We talk about shoulder impingement all the time in our clinic. We do a lot of ultrasound guided procedures around shoulder impingement to basically try and calm things down, so on and so forth. So uh, turning it over to you, why is it not that type of diagnosis and how would you better classify it? Yeah, so... Uh, back in the the seventies, you know, it was, uh, coined by Dr. Charles Neer. You know, he came up with the surgery for uh, shoulder chromioplasty, and so you know, he was seeing all these patients come in with uh, shoulder pain, and you know, he'd open them up, and you know, saw you know, rotator cuff tears and all that stuff, and and so he kind of pieced together that, you know, I think there's a, a decrease in the subacromial space, and we need to increase this space, uh, you know, through you know, surgical means and and stuff like that. Uh, to help these patients again. And in fact, in, in 1983, uh, he wrote that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said in the author's experience, 95% uh, of rotator cuff tears are initiated by impingement. And so he really, uh, like it, you know, fit that, you know, the, the top of the supraspinatus is rubbing against the underside of the chromium. And uh, this decrease in subacromial space is what's kind of driving this, this pain and pathology. Um, but so when we start looking at the the evidence behind this, uh, we can start to see that it really doesn't hold up that much. And so uh, first thing is, uh, when we look at where rotator cuff tears actually occur, uh, the, the majority of them occur either intra-substance or on the inferior aspect of the tendon. Uh, so it doesn't occur on the top of the tendon where you know he thought that you know it was rubbing on the underside of the chromium and tearing there. So not enough to just kind of discard this impingement model completely, but it should at least kind of get the, the wheels turning a little bit. And so uh, next on the list, uh, PARC 2020 did a systematic review and meta-analysis on uh, uh, people diagnosed with shoulder impingement, and they looked at their painful shoulder, and they compared it to healthy controls, and they also compared it to their uninjured side. And so they wanted to see, is there a decrease in the subrochromial space in those with uh, shoulder impingement? because uh, that's kind of the whole the whole basis of it. And they found that there's no difference in the subacromial space uh, between their uninjured side, their injured side, or healthy controls. So that should, I mean, that's kind of the, the whole premise of the surgery is, hey, we want right. to increase that subacromial space. And, you know, lo and behold, when we actually look to see, you know, is, is there anything there? Uh, there's not. Uh, and so... Uh, Rebecca Lawrence's group uh, looked at shoulder impingement as well. In oh, I've got a, a cat that just. <laughs> if you're just listening, his cat definitely <laughs> just jumped on the back of his chair. This is that's great. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so Rebecca Lawrence's group looked at shoulder impingement uh, in in healthy people and wanted to see like when does this occur, and they found that it occurs in roughly 40 to 70 degrees. So most people with shoulder impingement. It's typically more painful when they get up higher, you know, 90 degrees, stuff like that. Uh, so again, when it gets up to 90 degrees, that supraspinatus tendon uh, is already uh, uh, medial to the uh, uh, chromium, so it can no longer be impinged. Uh, and in the in the group they looked at, uh, impingement occurred in roughly 45% of the population. So in 55% of the population, they rose their arm up the entire way, and they didn't notice impingement. And in the in the people that they did, it was roughly in that 40 to 70 degrees. Uh, and then finally, when we look at subacromial decompression surgery, so this would be like a, a Pavola and Beard's randomized control trials. Uh, they took uh, subacromial decompression and they compared it against a diagnostic arthroscopy, so a, a sham surgery. And so that they just cut them open, looked around, they didn't fix anything. Uh, and they found no difference at one year, two years, or five years um, and in pain or function. So if the, if the fixing, if the quote unquote fixing uh, doesn't need to be fixed, uh, if the rotator cuff tears are occurring more intrasubstance or on the bottom and not at the top, if the people with the, uh, the subacromial space, there's no difference uh, between injured and, and healthy controls, 
um, and impingement's actually completely normal. I think we can uh, confidently say that 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 pathoanatomical diagnosis of the shoulder, you know, raising up and there's a decrease in the space and things are pinching and tearing. I think that can be discarded. I appreciate like the depth and the history that you went into that. Uh, it makes complete sense, especially with all the anatomy. Is there any nuance there, you know, for people that, and I'm going to blank on it and you probably have all these, you know, where bone spurs are growing off different ways or, you know, all the different things. Does that change this conversation just kind of more to the individual or does it seem to still semi hold true that even with those potential abnormalities there, which I'm guessing, you know, is most of what the acromioplasty is for is to clean up a lot of that. Any difference there? Or is that just another part of this kind of bigger conversation? Yep. Uh, no, no huge difference. And uh, there's some uh, uh, cross-sectional studies, um, which again, can't show causation, but like, a, like a done 2014 uh, looked at, I want to say like 300 people uh, with uh, shoulder impingement and they looked at like the amount of tendons torn, like fatty infiltration, uh, like the severity of the tear, like is that correlated to pain? And it's really not. Uh, so, you know, it's like, you'd think that, okay, if someone has uh, a tear in their supraspinatus, their infraspinatus, their subscap, like they're probably gonna have more pain than someone who just has pain in their, a tear in their supraspinatus. Uh, but when we look at, again, it's cross-sexual studies, uh, but when we, when we look at it, uh, there, there's no difference there. Sure. Um, so again, uh, the, the, the way I like to, you know, describe it to, to patients, uh, that really have this, this notion that, you know, uh, pain is this direct, uh, one-to-one -to, -one to damage is that, you know, I'll say, well, have you ever, you know, banged your shin against the coffee table? And they're like, oh yeah, I've done that. I'm like, roughly on a scale of one to 10, like, was it like at a one or a two or was it higher? And they're like, oh yeah, it was higher. I'm like, okay, well, you didn't have any damage there, but again, you experienced a, a high level of pain. If, if pain was just this direct correlation to damage, you shouldn't have had any, you know, like a, a one if, if that, and they, they sit there and they're like, huh, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I that's a great example. And one I will definitely probably use here in the future, because we have a lot of that same thing where we'll see you know somebody will come in and oh i had you know all of a sudden all this pain in the last four months and then you go and you look at imaging and those rotator cuff tears are not from you know any time within the last year most likely because of you know, retraction or fatty infiltration or just ever, the way everything's looking and it's for whatever reason on that day your pain decided to go up or you had a fall that now just exacerbated all of that yeah. didn't result didn't create the injury but definitely made you notice that it is now there yeah yeah the thing like if 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 you're to get me like four or five because i i used to like when, when i was diagnosed with uh like shoulder impingement when i was younger like i really bought in like i tried to change my pitching mechanics because i was like oh i don't want these tissues to to pinch and all yeah. that stuff uh but so if you were to ask me like four or five years ago when i like started uh getting kind of exposed more to this uh uh, you know, research, I'm just like, oh, like, perhaps there's other ways to look at this. Uh, but there's a couple times where like, I just like spewed out like, oh, we don't call it impingement anymore. And, and, you know, pain doesn't equal damage. And they looked at me like, okay, you're, you're, you're nuts. And, and I don't want to deal with you. <laughs> so, you know, now, you know, I, I try to, I try to ask them, I say like, okay, like, what is shoulder pain? Like, you know, someone comes in, and they've been diagnosed with shoulder impingement uh, by like a, a you know a, like maybe another athletic trainer or or their doctor, physical therapist, you know. So I'll say like, all right, what does that mean to you? And if they say, I don't know, it just kind of hurts when I raise my shoulder up, I'm like, cool, you know, that's you know, I, I I'm not gonna be like, oh, we don't call it that anymore. Sure. But on the other hand, if they're like, well, it it means like every time I raise my arm up and experience pain, that those tissues are tearing and I, I'm screwed. And I, I need surgery. I don't know why I'm here for doing exercises. Exercises aren't going to fix a tear. Like you're you're wasting my time. Then I do need to have that conversation sure. with them because if I try to get them to do exercises, and th this is where I hate like uh like patient was non-compliant with rehab and stuff like that. Like if I give somebody exercises for their shoulder and they think that this pain is damaged. Like they're not going to want to do their exercises because they think, hey, I'm just damaging it further. 
And then so is that their fault that they're not doing their exercises? Like I would say that's my fault for not checking with them and kind of checking their level of understanding. Uh, but on, on the other hand, like if I just sit there and spew a bunch of uh, like uh, like pain science at them, sure. Because I've done this before, you know, and they they look at me like it doesn't always need. And so that was my mistake. Is like I would try to all get this in like the first session, like the first consult, and like sometimes that doesn't happen until like three or four, uh, you know, time. You know, they see me like three or four times, and like hey, like, you know, it, it kind of is feeling better when I'm doing these exercises, but that, that tear is probably still there, right? And so we start having that conversation yep. there instead of me just spew, <laughs> spewing at them right away. Yeah, it highlights so much of, you know, meeting the patient where they are and what they want to, what they need to hear slash want to hear. And then, you know, figuring out how to even get them a little win, if you will, like each time you give them those exercises, they feel a little bit better leaving. And I'm not just doing these exercises, you know, mindlessly, um, you know, when I don't think they're in help, because then you're pretty much already um, in trouble. So you kind of alluded to what I was going to get into one of our next questions, you know, if it isn't shoulder impingement and using that as a broad diagnostic term, probably a loaded question, but what could it be then? Or have you seen um, both in the literature and your own experience that maybe driving that pain that we would go to a quote unquote shoulder impingement diagnosis. Absolutely. And I, I think this is like, and, and, you know, talking with uh, other athletic trainers, this is kind of that, that big hang up of, of, okay, like, well, like what, what, what's driving that nociception? What's, you know, what's, you know, what is this then? And so in, in the literature, uh, typically we'll call it uh, one of two things is either subacromial pain or they'll call it rotator cuff related shoulder pain, which is, uh, if, if you think of it this way, like a patellofemoral pain, you know, you, yep. uh, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. So you, you rule out, you know, iliotibial band tendinopathy, you rule out patella tendinopathy, you rule out, you know, Hoffa's fat pad, you're kind of left with, okay, you have patellofemoral pain. Well, what does that mean? It means your knee hurts. <laughs> uh, same thing with like non-specific low back pain, you know, you, sure. you, you rule out, you know, your your uh, you know spondyloarthritis you rule out you know radicular pain radiculopathy uh, you know cancer fractures stuff like that and you're kind of left with well could it be the uh, one you know a muscle back there possibly you know could it be you know the joint or you know uh, ligament back there maybe but we don't have a specific test to kind of uh, isolate that out and so same thing with the shoulder is that. You know, if if uh, you, you want to rule out, you know, instability, uh, depending on the population, uh, if you're, you know, if someone is like 50 years old and they have uh, uh, lo loss of range of motion in both active and passive, like probably not thinking shoulder impingement, probably thinking more, uh, you know, frozen shoulder. Uh, you know, if you have a 14 year old overhead athlete uh, complaining of like point tenderness on like AC joint and they have pain with like crossover uh, adduction and stuff like that. Like you might be dealing with like an osteolysis. Uh, so again, it's uh, the rotator cuff related shoulder pain is this broad general term. Like, could it be the bursa? Maybe. Could it be the corcrochromial ligament that's driving the nociception? Maybe. Uh, could it be, you know, one of the tendons or, you know, muscles, stuff like that? Possibly. But we don't have our, our special tests for the shoulder aren't that special. So when we look at like nears impingement, for example, so someone comes in and says, it hurts when I raise my arm up and you perform nears impingement and they go, yeah, that hurts. Well, yeah, they just told you it hurts, you know, but it doesn't tell us what structure is driving that nociception. So. I think that's such an important thing with just the nuance and trying to put the whole picture together and what hurts when it hurts, why um, things seem to go there. Cause yeah, I work with a sh shoulder surgeon along with a knee um, and just trying to piece it together using all of the contextual clues and figuring out what that is and everything you just said. Uh, and starting to address it, if you were looking at it, and this is, again, a very big question because we just kind of covered that it may or may not be any one of uh, a bunch of different things. How would you go about that? Like, what are your kind of go-tos? Do you have some resources that you found super helpful that, uh, people could potentially go and look up as well um, to try and help kind of break this down and not just say, oh, it's shoulder impingement. We'll do the kind of 
common modalities and kind of the basic of some shoulder rehab. Yeah. So when we look at it, we see that doing something's better than doing nothing. Uh, but for, for a subset of people, uh, pain's going to last a while. So like, even in those, uh, like, uh, uh, the, uh, the randomized control trials that you know looked at you know surgery versus sham uh most of them also had a th a third arm of like uh, a rehab or wait and see and we see that even in, in the the surgical arms the rehab arms there's uh, a subset of people that still have pain like two three five years out uh so what the the first thing i, I start with is kind of education is you know just kind of making sure they have this understanding that this this pain isn't this direct correlation to damage and we can do things uh to kind of get them back to what they want to do and so that's going to change you know if you're dealing with a, a baseball player you know you're going to want to work them into you know flexion you know horizontal abduction you know external rotation you you know want to hit all those things but is there like this one specific like must do exercise uh there's not and I think that's liberating because that just kind of gives us more options. And you kind of think about, okay, well, we don't have to worry about increasing the subacromial space because that's probably not what's driving that that pain. So, you know, if if you want to do, uh, you know, have them lay on a, on a foam roller for, for five minutes and kind of stretch out, like you can do that. Uh, if you want to hit more like strength exercises, uh, you can do that. Uh, the, the one thing I'd say is if your goal is to like return to sport, uh, making sure that they're strong enough to meet those demands is going to be helpful. Like I have nothing against doing like three sets of 10. Uh, in fact, just the other day I had athletes doing three sets of 10, but if, if your goal is strength, like you need to, uh, uh, it has to be like this moderate intensity close to failure. So if they're doing three sets of 10, but they could easily do, you know, five, 10 more, you're not working strength. And that's okay. You know, if you're working with someone that, you know, the goal isn't necessarily to get them stronger. You're just trying to kind of improve, you know, their tolerance to raising their arm up and all that stuff. That's fine. But if you're looking for this more kind of like return to play and getting them objectively stronger, then I would, uh, uh, encourage, uh, you know, athletic trainers and stuff like that to work in a moderate high intensity, uh, because just doing some exercises and they're able to do, you know, five, six, seven more reps, uh, you're not working strength. So a question I have on that and an approach I kind of started taking a lot with, you know, the kind of rotator cuff muscles. And I say that loosely, you know, because doing exercises, you're going to incorporate a lot of muscles. Uh, but even like hip external rotators, for some of those muscles focusing on like sets to, I would just say to like burnout. So when it really starts to burn, you know, we're not focusing on strength necessarily, because it's a smaller movement, but trying to rehab slash train those muscles more rehab wise, in the way because they're on all the time trying to, you know, balance everything keep things in place thoughts on that i totally agree with you on the strength thing and that you know i've always had that with athletes it's all right stop thinking rehab for this one we got to think strength training like we, that's that's our mindset we got to get you know rehab isn't always easy type of a thing but any thoughts on that like higher rep range for certain things especially around the shoulder um and any benefit or non-benefit which may make me change what i do but i'll turn that over to you yeah, uh, so th there's a couple trials that have looked at does adding more uh, exercises, does kind of just throwing more stuff at it, uh, is kind of like high volume, uh, you know, stuff like that. Uh, does that make any difference? And it really doesn't, but the uh, most of the trials, when they, they try to add more stuff, uh, the Patients just don't do them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so you know, take that for for what it is. Sure. Um, but but again, there there's nothing definitive that would say one way or the other. Um, so I would say you know you could go ahead and do it if it were to affect you know uh, 
okay, we're going to do this on, on Monday, then we're going to do this again on Wednesday, we're going to do this on Friday. And then, you know, on, on Wednesday, they're like, hey, like, I did that and it really lit me up and stuff like that. Then, like, sure. okay, maybe we back off a little yep. bit. Um, but otherwise, uh, there's nothing to say that you you can't do it or, or that you shouldn't do it. Gotcha. Um, kind of last question I had around shoulder impingement. Anything you've seen, you know, and again, I'd say that as we've been talking about this, um, that it's not really that, but prediction wise, you know, baseball players specifically, you said, you know, you played for um, a long time, uh, you know, into your late twenties uh, and obviously have worked with those athletes as well. Anything you found where you can kind of get an idea who maybe I use the term predict very loosely, but even like assess who might be a little higher risk of developing some issues um, or is that again, just kind of hoping for the best and seeing where it lands? Yeah. So it, 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 our, our, our screening measures uh, kind of stink for, uh, for predicting who will and won't get injured. Yeah. Uh, so when we look at like range of motion, for example, um, range of motion doesn't predict who's going to get injured and that's including GERD. Uh, GERD's not a risk factor for shoulder or elbow injuries. Uh, total range of motion, stuff like that. The only thing that's been found to be a risk factor uh, for shoulder injuries in, in general, not necessarily shoulder impingement, is professional baseball players. If they have less than a five degree surplus of external rotation on their throwing arm, they're more likely to get uh, injured. Um, but again, that's just for professional players. So you can't extrapolate that to high school. Um, so the people who are gonna get shoulder impingement, uh, there's no clear um, uh, uh, risk factor. Uh, scapular dyskinesis isn't a risk factor. Um, thoracic kyphosis, you know, some people think, well, you know, if, if you have more thoracic kyphosis, uh, you know, you're more likely to, you know, possibly get impinged or if the type of the shape of your uh, acromium, uh, but that's actually uh, been shown to not be the case. Uh, which which stinks because you know someone comes in and hey I'm, I I would say uh, the 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 thing that probably be most at risk would be like a, a history of it uh, yeah. so I've I've had it twice uh, but I had it in the left shoulder and right shoulder <laughs> so uh, you know could it be uh, you know I I would say probably like a, a past history of it but um, I, there's not enough information out there but. For like range of motion, scapular dyskinesis, like neither of those are risk factors. Got it. Interesting. Um, before we move on, anything else around shoulders, shoulder impingement in quotes that you wanted to talk about that we did not cover? Uh, I would just say that um, like I, I'm all for uh, like doing isolated, you know, external rotation, internal rotation, all that stuff. But our, our rotator cuff muscles, and, and you talked uh, about this too, is that they they work in more than just kind of external internal rotation. Right. So like your supraspinatus uh, works when you're doing lateral raises. It works when we're doing like overhead presses. So you don't necessarily, like if, if, if you're kind of thinking in this box of like, okay, well, I have to do external rotation. I have to do internal rotation. I have to do all this stuff. You can uh, uh, have them do, you know, pull-ups. You can have them do uh lateral raises uh the sky is the limit and those type of movements do work the rotator cuff to a high degree as well awesome appreciate you sharing there potentially a big transition now talking esports <laughs> um i just want to first before we get into any of the questions there your background and history um with esports and your own um experience if you could kind of share and set the stage for that Absolutely, yeah. So I played a, a computer game called uh, uh, StarCraft and StarCraft Brood War, uh, which is a real-time strategy. It's a one-on-one -on -one game. Um, it's based around uh, gathering resources, building an army, and you know beating the other guy. And it's uh, incomplete information. Like you don't get to see what they're doing. Uh, you, there's different methods you can do to kind of like you know, scout this out and stuff like that. But it's it's like a, a mix of poker uh, and you know a, a, a mix of you know how fast you can input commands and and stuff like that. So those who can input commands faster are going to be able to do more things and all that stuff and all that stuff. And so, you know, I played that for a long time and then on came 
uh, StarCraft II around 2010. So I got into that and was pretty good. Uh, and then I joined uh, uh, Complexity around 2011 or 2000, yeah, probably around 2011, uh, which was a professional uh, StarCraft team. And I joined their B squad. So hence I was semi-professional. I wasn't yeah, on, I wasn't on the, uh, the, the A squad. Uh, so I wasn't getting like paid. Uh, the, the only thing that, you know, the, the only time I made money was, you know, if I won money in like a tournament or something like that. And sure. my, my biggest winning was 200 bu- or 400 bucks. And that was for second place. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I did win some first place tournaments, but they were kind of like smaller. Um, so the like major tournaments that were like a hundred thousand dollars, like I wasn't place I wasn't placing in that. I could Got beat it. some of those players, uh, but more often than not, they beat me. So hence they were the better player. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so so that's kind of how uh, how I got into uh, esports is just that I I played it and I was good enough and I I uh, qualified for a tournament to kind of get onto their B squad, and then so they uh, had a, a gaming house down in Humble, Texas, and asked if I wanted to come down there and and live and and train for a while. And so I just graduated undergrad in 2012, and I was like, I was like, hell yeah, like it's perfect. So I, I went and did that for a while. Uh, and so that's pretty much like how I got how I got into esports. And yeah, nice. Um, as we kind of talked about at the beginning, you know, esports is becoming more common. Um, definitely have seen it as we're both in the state of Wisconsin pop up um, at different universities. Um, and that's becoming more common as well uh, for a bunch of reasons, I'm sure. Uh, how does that, how do ATs potentially fit in to esports? And I feel like you can, I can even come up with like some like what would seemingly be like logical or common sense ones, you know, with just some overuse, potential injuries, some postural stuff. Is there some, is there more to it or would, would the general person that hasn't been as involved with it as you have both, you know, from being a part of it from the playing side um, that would be good to know? Yeah. So I, uh, I would say first thing is uh, think of, uh, uh, esports, uh, think of those athletes as runners and the fact that if you were to tell a runner to stop running, they're going to laugh in your face and they're going to see somebody else. So if, if you have a, a gamer, uh, if you're working at a high school or college and you say, Hey, like, uh, you know, it, it's, it's hurting you right now. Maybe you should take a couple days off. Like they're, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's they're, fair. They're, 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 they're gonna, they're gonna ignore you after Good that analogy. Yeah, so uh, the the thing that's uh, – there's going to be a lot of kind of that, that overuse uh, and, and stuff like that. But what I think athletic trainers uh, – because not all eSport athletes are that kind of like stereotypical, like like fat, lazy. They're not active. Um, you know, some of them, you know, have played, you know, other sports, and they, they might know what, you know, athletic trainers are. Uh, but some of them – are that more stereotypical, like, ah, I'm not really interested in sports and stuff like that. So this might be their, their first interaction and they may have no idea what an athletic trainer can sure. kind of bring to the, t- the table. So if, if someone does have, uh, uh, you know, high school, uh, esports or college esports, you know, make sure that you're like going in there, you know, in- introduce yourself like, Hey, can I, can I, you know, watch, uh, you know, like a, a, a scrimmage and kind of see, cause the 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 people that play console are are gonna have different they're gonna have more kind of like finger uh wrist issues whereas computer may have more kind of uh like your lateral epicondylasia uh you know stuff like that more kind of up in the elbow they will kind of get down into the the hand and wrist too Mm -hmm. um but you know all those actions and and wrist movements uh can kind of go you know up uh up the elbow and and kind of affect that uh so it it really kind of depends on are you know are you dealing with console are you doing dealing with computers and you know i, I think w- one of the great things we can bring to the table is is you know okay it may hurt you after you know an hour and a half well can you set a timer on your phone for every hour and then every hour that goes off you stand up for a couple minutes you know uh you know stretch move around a little bit maybe do something to kind of break up that monotony so 
you know, maybe it said, oh, I can only play three hours because the pain gets so severe. Well, okay, I've been listening to the athletic trainer and I've been taking these micro breaks and it still kind of hurts, but I can play for five hours now instead of three. And then just kind of take those wins and, oh, what else do you have? And what else do you have? Because if you, if you just throw, okay, you're fat and lazy or you're just lazy and you need to do all these exercises, again, they're probably just going to blow you off. But if, if you can kind of meet them where you're at, it's like, okay, well, can we do some micro breaks or like, what do you have access to? Like, what do you want to do? And just kind of slowly start to incorporate that. And, you know, they'll say, okay, that, that does feel a bit better. That does feel a bit better. And then progressively go on from there. So I, I think that's where athletic trainers would like absolutely shine. Do you see that as a potential, I don't know how, you know, tied into the overall esport community you are anymore, but do you see more potential coming in the future? Because we were just talking either before or whatnot um, offline. I can't remember now. Uh, just like I know how from a brother-in-law how big it is to where he will, you know, that is what he does for entertainment. He watches people play um, the games instead of watching a sport game. You know, and you look at a lot of those high-level ones and – just for anybody who hasn't seen any of it, most of them are not large and looking out of shape. They're all fairly lean and into it. And so there is definitely a huge community out there. You know, they've got announcers, the whole bit. It is high production level and very impressive, uh, all for streaming. But do you see that as an opportunity growing as it has in other, you know, you, now you hear, you know, personal trainers and physical trainers and athletic trainers and auto sports and, you know, it's huge in golf, obviously, and has become more so as you see these golfers becoming more and more fit and um, powerful. So thoughts on that? Yeah. So I was uh, uh, back in 2015, I was offered. Uh, uh, so have you ever heard of League of Legends at all? I believe that is what my brother-in-law awesome. watches. Yeah. Thanks. So so they have uh, uh, their North America circuit, which is called uh, LCS. Uh, so they have, you know, professional teams and, and you know, they play against each other. So I was offered a, a coaching spot for one of those LCS teams. And it was more kind of uh, like a performance coach. So it would have, it would have incorporated some, uh, you know, medical things. Uh, and it was in California, uh, but it'd be mainly kind of, uh, you know, kind of guiding practices and, and, and stuff like that. So it was kind of vague in, in that regards. Um, but in that span, so that's 2000, uh, 2015. So, I mean, that's, you know, what, eight years ago? What am I doing math? Shit. <laughs> 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 Hopefully that's right. Yep. Uh, but yeah. So, uh, uh, but again, in in that span of time, uh, like 1HP is a group of uh, uh, mainly physical therapists, and they work with a lot of uh, the professional gamers in like uh, you know Overwatch, League of Legends, stuff like that. Um, so it's definitely growing, but it is kind of that wild, wild west still. Um, okay. We have we have another uh, uh, RTS that's going to pop up on the on the scene soon in beta. Uh, which are from the creators of StarCraft and WarCraft. And so that's potentially going to be huge. And so, you know, the, those college teams are, are probably going to pick that up. And so that's just going to keep driving, uh, you know, esports is a billion dollar industry and like more people are just going to, you know, keep playing it. And so eventually, you know, these structures are going to keep growing and growing and that, you know, cause you, you get, uh, you get a, uh, you know, you're, you're, your player who has a six, seven figure contract and all of a sudden they're out of the lineup for two weeks with an injury and you're looking around like, what the heck are we doing? It's like, oh yeah, you probably should have uh, some health, uh, healthcare professional on staff. Like sure. that might be a good idea. Um, they're not completely there yet, but they've recognized, you know, and so like, I think one HP uh, does like a lot of like consulting. Um, so not like with one specific team, I don't think, but they're just kind of like, all over the place. Um, but as that grows and as that grows, I I do believe that that's going to open more doors of opportunity, uh, you know, for athletic trainers. Uh, is that necessarily going to be in 2013 or 24, uh, 2023, 2024? Uh, I don't know, but it's, it's only continuing to grow. So. Absolutely. Anything else around esports that we didn't cover? Uh, I would say, uh, again, I would say that if 
if you're not super familiar with it and your your high school uh, has it or your college has a, a club team and, and you kind of you know uh, you know are, are, are working with the, uh, those kind of athletes you know ask uh, hey can I sit in for for uh, you know practice and just kind of watch and and kind of see what goes on because like when I when I played I was I wasn't slow but I wasn't super fast I averaged maybe like 220 250 actions per minute uh and some of those faster people mm -hmm. are up in like three four five hundred so that that's like a you know uh every keyboard click every mouse click and and that's you know some games could last for up to 30 minutes and you're talking 30 minutes of you know three four hundred actions per minute like that can add up yes absolutely oof kind of yeah that is a lot um then turning over to uh the athletic training chat questions where do you see athletic training going in the next five to ten years and i feel like you've kind of got a unique uh insight on this just from all the different uh aspects that you've had in your career uh while I, while i'm not necessarily uh, an optimist I do feel pretty good about the the profession. Like I know on social media, sometimes it can be like doom and gloom of like, oh, this profession's, you know, falling apart or whatever, blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't really see that. Like, I, I just, I, I, I see just more doors of opportunities opening up, uh, you know, as, as colleges become more aware that, hey, if we offer crap salary, like we're just going to lose people, right. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, and and you know you start looking around like I, I was at a, a I worked at a, a local university around here, and I went from being one of three athletic trainers to being the only athletic trainer left for twenty two Division three sports and D one club fencing. So you know I, I waited until you know all the others you know left, and I kind of looked around. And I was like, you know, are you guys going to hire anyone? And they're like, yeah, no, we'll, we'll we're we're fine. And so that's when I said, okay, I'm, I'm out of here. And uh, and so their their athletic director got moved into a different position, and I think we all know what that means. Uh, <laughs> so again, I think more colleges are starting to realize that hey, if we, you know, uh, are treating them uh, not as well as they probably should be, like they're not just going to hang around and, and deal with it. I think more people are just saying like, oh, I'll just leave and do something else now. And so I think that overall is going to you know lead to uh you know more opportunities better wages stuff like that and and that's that's what i that's what i believe anyways i like it uh if you could go back um and give yourself some advice when you were a younger athletic trainer what would it be and if you could kind of set you know when that would have been uh where you go back and give the advice i would say uh in in my first few years uh, I'd go back and, and tell myself that um, try to think of all the ways that this person in front of you uh, is getting better or is not getting better. Because I was very hooked into uh, like manual manual therapy, mm -hmm. uh, breaking up adhesions, breaking up, you know, trigger points, all that stuff. And, you know, if someone got better, I was like, oh, yeah, that's because I broke up an, an adhesion or something like that. And I, I didn't think of all the reasons why someone you know got better you know is it you know could it have just been time you know is it that therapeutic alliance uh is it because they got stronger is it just because they had a fear of movement and we kind of addressed that uh is it because exercises helps uh and uh reduce inflammation and there's an, inf an inflammatory component somewhere uh so all these different reasons why someone could or could not get uh you know get better um, but I was just kind of hooked on, well, I did this treatment and they got better. So that means that treatment got them better. And right. that's, that's not, that's not the case. And, and I was very hooked into that. Uh, and that kind of, uh, blinded me to like other options, uh, and kind of limited what I did and what I offered for like the first, I want to say probably like four, four years of being an athletic trainer. I can feel that advice a ton. Uh, uh, go back, <laughs> very something similar. Um, what has been the most influential resource you have found in your career? I would say Twitter. Uh, the not uncommon. Yeah, I say uh, like just the other day. Uh, so I was reading through uh, like bio uh, biomechanical 
uh, literature on running. And I, I wanted to make sure I had like a, a understanding of it. So I like, you know, posed the question and, you know, was getting uh, advice from, uh, um, from like physical therapists that have written papers on it, uh, who specialize in, in running sure. related injuries. Uh, I reached out to the, to like the lead author of, uh, uh, the telephomoral pain uh, guidelines, uh, Rich Willie in, in Montana, and it, like he responded and, and like you know kind of helped uh, you know make sure I was on the on the right track and and I was for the most part thankfully. Uh, but again, just just having that that ability to just be like I have a question and just kind of reach out and contact like some of the like. The, the leading es- experts, like the, the people that are like writing the papers and, and, you know, specializing specifically in these topics and just being able to pick their brain. Like, thank you, Twitter. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think there's a lot to be said for that, where you can, it's how you approach the question and then you can ask a question without it being combative just to learn. And that's, yeah, that's yeah. fun when that works out the way that it should. Yeah. As an AT in your role, how do you take care of yourself? Uh, a lot of drinking. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we have had somebody say wine before. So there you go. Yeah. Uh, I I pretty much so I I learned through uh, like uh, my dad, for example. Uh, he worked at a company for over thirty some years, and then eventually their workforce got a little bit older, and they brought in someone to pretty much get rid of all the old people, and I, I just kind of learned that everyone's expendable. You know, like, and, and that's not to say that we don't have an impact. Like, if you know, if if someone were to leave their job tomorrow, like, yep, s- things would slow down, and for some, that would slow down more than others. Like, your impact, you know, your absence would be noted, but things would still go on. And so, the the one thing that I keep in mind is is me first. So if if I'm in uh, like my my last role at one of the universities, you know, if I'm working 63 days in a row and they're not increasing my pay with with the increased job demands and everyone else left and they're like ah screw it, I'm not going to kill myself over that. Like I my my physical and my mental health are worth way more than than that. Like sure, see ya. And and so th- that's that's kind of that. Um, you know, how I take care of myself is like, I, I care, I care about my job. I love what I do. Like uh, a Friday, Saturday night might be staying in and reading research for like six hours. Like I'll nerd out on that for sure. But, you know, at the end of the day, like I'm not going to lose my physical or mental health uh, for a job. And so that if it gets to that point, then see ya. That's, and that's it. I think that's good advice. You could change or eliminate one thing could be a modality, a common practice, a mindset, or really anything of your choosing in the field of athletic training. What would it be? I would get rid of the whole thought process of evidence-based practice being a three-legged stool. Uh, So like a a lot of people uh, will say, well, you know, patient experiences are, are, are equal uh, you know, evidence is, is equal, all that stuff. I think, think of it more as a funnel. And I, I get this from, uh, uh, Eric, uh, Eric Mehta, uh, is that on the top, you have the totality of the evidence and that's like a, a critical, the ability to critically appraise the evidence. So if someone's reading research and they're just kind of like reading the author's, author's conclusion, uh, that's not necessarily, uh, critically appraising the research because there's, there's uh, uh, authors that will state the conclusion as as something, and then you look at the data, and it doesn't support that. Uh, you know, I've been in some when, when there was uh, evidence-based uh, CEUs. Like I was in some of the classes where they were talking about uh, between group differences, uh, or excuse me, intergroup differences. So from baseline to postline of the same group, as a, as a as an effect, and you, you can't do that. You have to compare between groups. And so I, I'm looking at this. I'm like, this is an evidence-based CEU, and they are they are messing this up. So again, I, I would, you know, that would be the the top of the funnel. The the middle of the funnel being uh, patient experiences. You know, if if someone comes to me and says, well, uh, you know, I want to do bloodletting uh, because I think it works. Like I'm like, sorry, that's not going to happen. Uh, so again. 
part of, and again, whether it's rotator cuff related shoulder pain, whether it's uh, uh, quadriceps strain, like whatever, uh, part, there's, there has to be informed consent uh, and there has to be this kind of like shared decision making. So if someone wants to do cupping, like I don't do cupping, uh, I don't do ISTM. That doesn't mean that you can't offer that, but you know, cupping doesn't outperform a sham. Uh, I, ISTM uh, isn't recommended for anything. This would be like Nazari 2019 and like 2022 systematic review. Um, that doesn't mean you can't do it, but it's not breaking up adhesions. It's not doing trigger points. Uh, trigger points don't exist. Uh, if, if, if any of the, if anyone wants to learn more about that, I think Wolf 1992 or 1994 uh, had David Simons on there, uh, who wrote the helped write the book on trigger points, and he wasn't able to find trigger points in a group. Uh, they had three groups. They had a healthy control. They had myofascial pain, and they had a group of trigger points, and they have rec recruited them from uh, from like the clinic locations, aside from the healthy controls. So they were people diagnosed with trigger points, and then David Simons and you know other experts tried to examine it, and they they couldn't find it. So if the person that wrote the book on trigger points can't find trigger points, uh, I'm calling BS. <laughs> So like sore spots, you know, you press on something, it's sore and it hurts. That That's a thing, but trigger points, not so much. Uh, but so that kind of got, got off on the tangent. No, but so does. like pa patient experience and just kind of like this in informed consent of like, you know, what's what's going on? What are the pros and cons? What are my options? And then you kind of agree to that. And then your, your kind of clinical experience. And that's being able to reflect on, why someone isn't isn't you know getting better and in the you know populations that you're you're working with so it's more kind of this funnel than everything being equal like i would i very much challenge that okay i like i like the different approach uh last question what does being an athletic trainer mean to you it means being able to provide uh the best health care possible uh i i very strongly believe uh, you know, we're, we're healthcare professionals, you know, board certified medical license, like we know what we're talking about, uh, being able to provide, you know, top notch healthcare coverage, uh, whether it's a, a athlete, uh, whether it's, you know, in the industrial setting, you're working more gen pop, uh, whether you're in the military setting, we're, you know, tactical athletes, you know, whatever. Um, I strongly believe that, you know, athletic trainers are, are those, you know, healthcare professionals, like we know what we're doing. We know what we're talking about. Uh, we, we have a place at the table. Perfect. Uh, just to wrap up then, if people wanted to follow you, connect with you, you mentioned Twitter, uh, what would be the best place for them to do that? Yeah, I, I'd say uh, Twitter is the the best bet. Uh, I do have a TikTok where I'll, I'll post a lot of in informational stuff. Uh, both uh, uh Usernames are like ambivalent hypoc, and the reason why it was hypoc is because uh, couldn't be long enough for I was gonna have it say ambivalent hypo uh, hypocrisy or something, uh, but it was too long, so it just ended there. <laughs> like, Fair enough. Didn't really mean much. I just I I wanted to be I I just didn't want it to be my name, but I don't know. It's weird. Uh, I didn't want it to be my gamer tag, which is Aero Senen, because I'm a big Naruto fan. Uh, but that it's Japanese for perverted hermit, and I'm just like I don't necessarily know if if I want my Twitter name <laughs> to be that. Uh, so, <laughs> but yeah. So so anyways, if if anyone wants to find me, it would be uh, like Twitter or or TikTok. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, this was really interesting. I know I took a lot more of points just to kind of help formulate how I would respond to things. So I appreciate that with everything. And uh, now knowing we're both in Wisconsin, hopefully we'll cross paths here sometime in the near future. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for listening to this episode of Athletic Training Chat with Sean Goff, who really brought some interesting light and data and research to shoulder impingement. Hopefully you get something away from that and just different way to look at that potential diagnosis and how you would potentially incorporate that into your value into the future but as always powered by Mueller Sports Medicine thank you again for listening to this to help support our Throughout Lifeline program uh, we're continuing to grow 
that fund to help get athletic trainers some of the necessary supplies they need to provide the best quality of care to their patients. We truly appreciate that. If you haven't yet, check out the Athletic Training Daily Journal. You can find that on Amazon or clinicallyquest.org slash shop. Uh, that is just a chance to read a quote or a passage and reflect and develop as a professional and as a practitioner. And so we hope that would be something that you can find useful. Uh, make sure to check that out. And until next time, thank you for listening. We'll catch you on the next episode.